Well, I'm excited to introduce somebody that I've known for a very long time. He has been in the community helping thousands and thousands of families. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Newbrander. It's my pleasure and honor, really. It's great. It's great. Well, can you tell families out there, you know, a little bit about your practice and, and what you're doing today? Basically, I've seen around 3,500, 4,000 kids with autism, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders also, and, you know, that type of thing, uh, pediatric practice. And I'm not a pediatrician. I take care of these children when the pediatricians either say nothing can be done or give up on them and say, oh, you know, do this and do that, and it really doesn't work. Then the parents have found me, and that's nice, and it's an honor to be and a privilege to be able to take care of my families. And that's what I've done. I've been doing uh, biomedical, alternative, functional medicine, whatever you want to call it, since 88. Uh, autism came to my life in about 92, a little bit earlier than most, but it became, it hit everybody in about 1997, 98, and the exponential curve. And so I did not choose to see autism. I didn't know much about autism, as any of us did, but it just showed up on my doorstep, and here I am today. So, and we've been able to help uh, most of the children improve at least moderately, uh, many moderate to significantly, and we've had many, many recovered children out of the group I've seen. So, but so have my colleagues. But so that's it. You know, it's not a, it's not an advertisement for you know for myself. It's just find somebody that can help. For the new parents. Well, you're very humble, but we're, and I know us in the community are very grateful for doctors like you that didn't pick this as their field, and yet said, you know what, there's help that's needed, and you really, you really put, you know, you stepped up and you've helped, like I said, thousands and thousands of families. Where are you located out of? I'm uh, located about 25 minutes south of uh, the Newark Airport in New Jersey, okay. in, uh, near Rutgers University, if anybody knows where that is. Okay. And so, let's say some a family gets diagnosed. What are some of the first steps that you would recommend them doing? Well, most most parents come to me. They've already, you know, they've gotten the diagnosis. It's devastating. They've gotten out there. They've tried to find information from other parents. Most parents come to me. Uh, most, not all, already doing a casein-free, gluten-free diet. I believe in that. I think they all, everybody should definitely try that. Uh, most of them are on some degree of supplements, though many aren't. So those are the, you know, those are foundational. I think everybody needs to be on uh, some kind of diet or diets, whatever's right for them. And the basic one that most start with is casein-free, gluten-free, okay? Easy, no, helpful, yes, and about 60-some percent. Uh, supplements to me are foundational. There's some that we can use to do specific things, but in general they're a foundation just like we wear clothes. We can work just as good naked as we can not <laughs> at work, but we will get in trouble if we don't. So in other words, clothes are foundational, supplements are foundational, so for everything else to work better, all right? So that's kind of where that goes. And then w one of the things I do that I believe is different than most of my colleagues, immediately I start children on uh, methyl B12, I found it by accident in 2002. It's helped most of my children. Most will have, the parents know what they're looking for and if it's done right. Most of the parents can document anywhere, if, again, if it's done right, between the averages about 44 different things that methyl B12 can do for them out of about 155 possibilities. This was created by the parents themselves after thousands and thousands of letters and reports. They were, we call it the parent design report form, and that is one of the things that's very different. We're trying to, we're in the process right now of uh, trying to get that scientifically evaluated to be out there for all the parents and doctors and clinicians to use. So, you know, it works. So I start there, you know, make sure they have the diet. I start there, and then if they have GI problems, we'll uh, tackle those. If they have, uh, allergies or autoimmune uh, disorders, we will attack those if they have mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial disease is not common. Mitochondrial dysfunction in these children is very common. We work with that. Uh, detoxification is not just heavy metals. Detoxification is to everything that's you know, affecting us in our lives today. These children don't have the ability to get rid of uh, the toxins that we have. Even if they get the same amount or even less, then others that can handle it, they don't handle it, so it builds up. So it's like having a funnel with a real narrow 
you know, narrow uh, end to it and the stuff doesn't come out. So detoxification is very important. I probably forgot some, but those are, I'm sure I did, <laughs> but those are the basics. Those are the basics. And I, I'm sure I forgot a basic or two, but here I am scared to death to be able to talk to you <laughs> and to the public because I'm just a very scared of everything. <laughs> Well, I know I know you're very well known for methyl B12. I know you've had some great, great cases um, of families that have had tremendous help from that. I know a lot of families watching might not understand what that really means. Um, you know, is that a pill they take? Is it a liquid form? Is it an injection that they have to give their child? Oh, by the way, one of the things I forgot, I do get the hyperbaric eventually. <laughs> now, uh, as far as methyl B12, it's, we've gone through, you know, again, I found it by accident. It was an injection. We were using the two forms that were in the United States prior to 1998, the cyanob, uh, cyanob B12 cobalamin, cyanocobalamin, and hydroxycobalamin. And at the uh, think tanks and all that we would go to, it would come up, but the consensus was that there was no consensus that it was working. And I was uh, part of board certified in environmental medicine, and one of the things that I would do is, uh, IVs for multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue, different things, you know, environmental injuries, etc. And, uh, you know, in the courses we would take for intravenous therapy, they would uh, eventually said, let's try methyl B12. So I had it on my shelf from 98 till 2002. I would use it for the, those kind of patients, never saw anything, never even thought to use it on a child with autism. And then one day I said, duh. That was how it came. Look, <laughs> really brilliant. Duh. Uh, why don't I try it on this child? And within six weeks, uh, the boy was four and a half years old. He had, no, you know, he could use a couple words, but no combination of words, uh, no socialization, no eye contact uh, to any degree. He didn't even, he was not one of the ones that was even affectionate. Most, most of these kids are at least affectionate to their parents. He had really minimal affection. And within a few weeks, he started, you know, improving significantly. By the time the parents came back to me about six weeks later, they said, we can't believe it. It's like he never shuts up. He just keeps talking to everybody. He looks them in the eyes. He's now, not only does he hug and kiss us now, but he's hugging, he's hugging the crossing guard and kissing the bus driver. And wow. he says, it's like he's making up for all these years. He says, and sometimes he'll put together as many as four, six, sometimes eight words together using sometimes, not always adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, and he says it's a miracle. And the mother said, yeah, when we go to our bedrooms at night and look at each other, we say, you know, maybe we liked it better the other way when we had some <laughs> peace and quiet. So that's methyl B12. There's different ways it's being, it works best if it's done injectable by a, a very small injection in the buttocks at night when the children are sleeping after they've had some numbing cream, they do not feel it. So it's not one of these people think injection, it's a big painful needle. So painless, done at night, done right. It has to be done right or it doesn't work. Pills don't work that well, but they're better than nothing, so, uh, nasal, and all these other ways we work through. So that's kind of that one. How often is it? Uh, there's different protocols for everybody, I assume. Well, and the protocol, that's beyond what I should put on tape. <clears throat> so there's better ways to do it. Uh, my basic protocol is once every three days, but it... it it's all based on what the doctor feels. It is. Yeah. It is yeah, it's based on what methyl B12 can do. Yeah, exactly. And again, again if, if done right, and that's not saying that colleagues don't do it right. I think the people who haven't really studied and done this, it would be better if they would learn, you know, the ways to help it work better. Okay, so that's it. <clears throat> so that's kind of. And is there testing done for the child to <clears throat> see if their methyl B12 is low? Now, the methyl B12, the interesting part, methyl B12 for most children with uh, who respond, it's not. It, it, if anything, it's high normal or high at baseline. Okay. And people say, and then that's why the pediatricians and everything until more is published about it say, well, they don't need it. You know, think of it this way. I talk about, uh, I call it methyl B12 diabetes. With diabetes, I say, do people have high blood sugar or low blood sugar? They say high. I say, right, they have high blood sugar where they don't need it in the plasma. They have it low in the cell where it's needed because it can't get in. And so what happens is we have to use very high doses with methyl B12 so it can get out of the plasma, pass a transporter 
whatever it is deficit that we still need more research on. Everything needs more research. Uh, so basically to get it into the cell so it can do the job. And so therefore, these children, it backs up just like in the blood. They're not on it. The kids that do the best oftentimes have the highest, you know. And so the pediatricians say, you don't need it. Yeah, if we're looking for where. So when people can make the analogy how to understand it, not to be 12 diabetes, they can understand it's high here but it's low there where we need it to be able to do what it does. What methyl B12 does for the kids, it gets, uh, works best for speech and language. It, uh, that's where the parents, and again, the thousands of parents, tens of thousands of report forms. Basically, I think it's 84.7% is the latest data. Uh, will show some degree of increase, mild initially, some degree of increased speech and language. Uh, markers, speech and language, focus and attention, cognition, memory, socialization. Those are the things it does. And what's really surprising is that uh, most of these kids with uh, the, the, you know, the regressive type of autism, which is most of what we see, most of these children already have, um, are affectionate to their own families. They become even more affectionate. I mean, that is, that is the one that 75 point something percent of the parents say. It's amazing that they were already affectionate, but now they're so much more affectionate. Now, is it something they have to be on long term, or is it? Most of my children, if it's done right, most of the children uh, are on it about three to five years. And you can start at any age. So if someone's watching and their child's 15, let's say, and they've never worked with a biomedical doctor, it's, you don't have to be four or five to start this. No, you might get different things. You know, I mean, I have a good chance of this with everything else I do, not just this. So I don't want to be misunderstood. Absolutely. If I get a child, thing. if I get a child, you know, two years old, two, you know, whatever, we have a much higher chance of full recovery, of going very far, full recovery than we do with a teenager or whatever. But we, there's no age. I, I've worked with them any age, all the way up to fit in the 50s, the 30s, the 20s, okay, and many, and, you know, multiple teenagers and whatever. They all can have some benefit. The problem is parents want too much too soon. This is a process. It's not, it's not. I say there's a difference between a process and an event. If you take a sleeping pill, you go to sleep and you wake up and need it again, okay? If you take an allergy pill, you know, you quit sneezing for a few hours and then you need it again. This is something, basically, it gives us something small amount of benefit and it goes over time as long as a person keeps doing it. It's like going to college in six weeks. It's my first evaluation point. In six weeks of college, you're not that much smarter, but you can see whether you're going to be able to make it if you continue to do the job. Parents, the biggest problem with parents is they want too much too soon. And if they don't see something big enough, they say, oh, this might have worked for a while, then they don't see it working. It's still working. They just don't see the whatever. And so they quit. And so most parents in my practice will quit after two and a half years because they just want this and don't understand that the ones that I've seen, the most of my full recoveries, which are many, and most of my, those that go the farthest are the parents that have been with me four, five, six, seven years. It's like college. And so that's what I do. I call one of the things I do is I have an autism college comment. It is like college. You get in college, you start college, you go you don't start for six weeks or 12 weeks or one semester or three semesters a year. You go one year, two years, three years, four years. There's ups and there's downs and there's ups and downs. And that's it. And in my practice, Methyl B12, we focus this question on that. It's just one part of multiple things I do. All those things I started out with, mm -hmm. and then I forgot hyperbaric, and I do that too with those that can afford it. You know, all of those things make what we can do to help the child. But the take-home message is these children can be helped. I, it's extremely rare. In my clinic, I think I have calculated it's only 2% of children that I cannot help. And my colleagues that would do the same, I'm sure it's the same if they would, you know, when my colleagues do these things. If the parents don't want to graduate from college in six weeks or one month or three months. So that's the problem. So the big disconnect between clinicians and parents and the autism communities is because they haven't taught the parents the one most important rule of everything. Don't want too much too soon. We can want it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work like that. It's like going to college, and it really is. And if a person stays in college long enough, you don't drop out of college after two years and hope it works. Most of my parents drop out of autism college, and most of my colleagues, I've asked them after about two and a half years. And you don't get it through college in two and a half years.
Excellent. So I must have a PhD because I've been doing it 14 years. Well, yes, but okay, that's, that's true. <laughs> then I, I want to come back to that. You've been doing it. The thing is, too, not every child can not every child can be able to be those that move. If we take, if we, your child has, I'm sure, been helped. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been doing it. Well, the thing is, and I think with parents, too, is, yeah, you're going to take five steps back, four steps forward, ten steps back, three steps That's forward. Exactly. And, and what happens is sometimes you can get very discouraged, and you do spend a lot of money. But at the end of the day, you look at your kid, and they still need help. So you got to keep on going, and you pick yourself up, and you say, all right, today was hard but it was better than it was last year. Right. And and that's where you go. And so I know a lot of families out there, and I, and I agree, I've seen a lot of parents out there that they'll start and it's just too hard after a while. And and I, and I love the fact that you say this is not you know something that's going to be fixed overnight. I often think of it as that race with the turtle and the hare. And I'm like, well, we're the turtle. We'll eventually get to that end of that race. I don't know when that's going to be, but we'll eventually get there. And so I love your analogies of that. Um, I think it's so important for the families to hear that. It's important also for me to say this because when we talk about the baseline, what's most important is not how far some kids go and how far some kids don't go. And most, most if they keep doing it, will go. But the thing is, too, that's difficult for all of us that sit in my uh, position as clinicians or those that are really you know into it like you is, we have to work within the parents' budget and finances and everything else. And so just because I say, oh, you know, this therapy would work, Maserati, Maserati therapy, I can guarantee your child will be recovered perfectly. If you can pay cash today, uh, whatever it takes to buy a Maserati, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, you know, those of us as clinicians who we have to think about what's ethical, what's moral, what's right, the integrity, and be able to give the parents hope for what they can do, mm -hmm. not take it away. Well, you should be doing this, or you can't do this, so I'm sorry. It, it just doesn't work. It's a that fine way. line. It's a fine line, and that's the balance where we have to balance this. But that's where it comes between the parent and the, pa and the parent and the patients and the child and the, you know my you know us, we as clinicians doing this. Okay, and I have a lot of great colleagues, and so it's not this is not an advertisement for me. No, absolutely. Well, we as parents appreciate you. I've known you for many many years, and I've heard many many of your lectures. I've learned so much from you. If a parent were to just get the diagnosis, let's say they just got the diagnosis today, they don't know what to do, um, they're feeling lost, what advice can you give them? Basically what they need to do is, there are a lot of parent groups out there. Some things are kind of, you know, it's like, you, you know, you go to this group, you go to that group, whatever, you do this, you do that. What we need, what they need to do is find a good clinician who really understands a broader base than we just do this thing and we just do thing, not just a, I'm a yeast doctor, I'm a, I'm a mercury doctor, I'm a this doctor, I'm a somebody who can put this together for them where they can find and get to that, you know, get to that doctor soon. The sooner they go, the better. The problem is so many times, you know, they'll go along and usually it's the father who says, nope, my kid's fine, it's, you know, he's just delayed and the mother's whatever. It's not always that way, but you know, they just need to be able to get to somebody who they believe can be able to help them and to go to that person to be able to help lay a groundwork. You know, and something that they can work within their belief system, within their culture, within the money they have or don't have and put it together. They have to start. The first thing, you never can go anywhere unless you start. And the problem is so many parents don't start or they don't start soon enough until they're told by their pediatricians or neurologists there's nothing you can do, just take this therapy or that. I've never had a, a recovered kid ever be able to get there or a kid go very far, okay, because I know not all do. You know, I've had never had any of them go there without speech, language, all the all the different therapies, plus do the biomedical. The biomedical added to that is they work together. You know, it's not one or the other, and that's another danger. And so what happens is so many parents are hear, hear from their pediatricians or neurologists or their doctors, there's nothing you can do. That's not right. So they do, they delay, so they get the diagnosis at two. 
you know, yes, they'll do early intervention and those things. That's great, but the child can only go in so far. And then at three years old, they don't—they lose the ability to do it, and the insurance doesn't pay. And then everybody's hoping they can find some system where insurance will pay. It's not that there. Good luck, you know. Some. So basically, then they delay and delay and delay. And by the time they get to us, maybe a year and a half to two and a half to three years is going by, and they're basically at the end of their ropes. It's not good to start college at the end of your rope. It's good to start college early. It's good to start the whole thing earlier than later. So the earlier they start, the earlier they can sit there and say and study and find it's you know study and review and get out there. I mean, I'd be I believe in the parent groups. That's where I teach. I teach my parents. I say that I've learned twenty percent of what I've learned from medical school. I've learned eighty percent from parents. However, it's what it's why what parents are saying might be true when I listen to it. Not that it doesn't make sense, it's why it might be true. They might sit there and say, this treatment is due to something they're doing that's not even scientifically related, but what they're doing is getting the results from something that is happening. Why can something work? So we put it together to see why what they're saying can really work and happen. And so really, the thing is, I want the parents to get out there and find you know, the parent groups, but I also caution them, don't put their all their eggs in one parent group basket or one. Be able to get it and then find the clinicians who have studied this for years and put, have had for really no. I mean, going to one or two conferences as a physician is a good start. That's where I was years ago. I'm not saying they can't go or start there, but they need to be able to go on this journey to be able to not just, oh, my doctor, he's gone to a conference or somebody advertises, I mean, I'm a, I am treat autism or whatever. Maybe they do, but how good, where, how much do they know? So the parents, it's out there now where they can learn, where they can study, where they can really get this and put it together. And that is the most important. Get the information, put it together, find somebody who understands who can help them from where they're coming, and that's and that's that really good advice. Trying to find someone to help put all those pieces together in the puzzle that really has been around and knows what they're doing. So thank you so much for being one of our doctors that have helped put so many pieces together for so many of our families. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor and privilege to be here, <laughs> and I wish all the parents the best of luck. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Newbrand. Thank you.